please come in and find a seat as we begin our song service with I Shall See the King.
opening song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. you for the message and song. May the transformation that we just sang about be the transformation that's happening slowly and almost imperceptibly in our lives, but certainly happening. And thank you, Lord, that Jesus, your gift, our God, would come to this earth and pay such an infinite price to make us yours again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, song leaders. All right, if you have your Bibles tonight, if you'll open them up to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm going to take us on a Bible study about how to calibrate relationships. Now, let me give you a little practical example about how that happens. Yesterday, I was sitting outside talking to my wife on the phone. And my wife and I had to come to an understanding because I travel a fair amount in my job. She would go sometimes days without hearing from me. Now, occasionally, I'm in difficult places to communicate. Now, we came up with an agreement that when I travel, it's my job to call her. Now, I want you to think on the axis of trust, respect, and affection, where that's at. In other words, I'm out engaging with a lot of people. Kind of at the heart of that issue is, do I remember that I have a wife and children back home? And are they a prize and a treasure to me? 
So we got that worked out. And of course, my wife doesn't travel as much as me, but if you're the one left behind, you figure out what it feels like. It doesn't feel good. So it's nice when your spouse calls you up. And that's our agreement. That way, she has a sense that even though I'm out, sometimes going to neat places, although travel is a lot more fatiguing and a lot less neat when you do a lot of it. But nonetheless, for the person at home that's going through the regular routines, my mother-in-law lives with us. She's elderly now and needs help. And my wife takes care of almost 30 fourth graders all day long. She comes home and she takes care of my dear mother-in-law. And that's pretty ordinary life. So we got that figured out. But let's do something kind of practical here. Let's talk about yesterday and today. So yesterday, I'm sitting outside talking with my wife, and someone comes up, and uh, actually I had two things in one short period of time. I had the principal from my church school call, and it was kind of important, so I said, hey, can I call you back? I had been on the phone with her for 60 seconds when he tried to call me. Now, because we've generated a lot of trust and respect and security for each other through the years, it's not an immediate offense to her. No problem. I call her back. Then we talk for 26 minutes. How do I know this? Because my wife and I had to solve a problem this afternoon. And, I, and, and she talked about me not talking for very long. And then she was, well, I never called my wife back yesterday. That's the real heart of this problem. So we're talking for 26 minutes. And then I got another interruption. The problem was, was that after that happened, my evening with eating supper here and then having a program here and the fact that there's three hours difference and by the time I got back to my room, it was way too late to call her. So I called her this afternoon, which is evening out there, and we had to kind of talk through something. And what we had to talk through was the fact that I never called her back. Now, I've been married for almost 40 years, but I'm here to tell you people remain people who can grow the right way and the wrong way as long as they have a brain and they have breath. And relationships need to be constantly cared for. And so even just today, because I forgot to call my wife back, we're solving little potential things. Now, some people sweep that under the rug. And I do have a phrase, in, in your future marital relationships, there'll be some things you dismiss. Wasn't big enough to talk about. But there'll be a lot of other things you discuss because it's bothering you. Now, I'm tempted to go off on a different link, but I'm not gonna. Let's take our Bibles, all right? I will tell you this. What I'm about to share with you out of the Word of God, if you get it right, you're going to have a good marriage. If you get it wrong, you're going to have a bad one. 1 Peter chapter 3. There's a lot in here about mutual submission. We just happen to be on wives and husbands in chapter 3. It says, in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the Word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So I want you to think about that. Let's make sure we understand it. If a woman in the pagan Roman Empire became a Christian, Paul did not discourage her in living out her Christianity, and he did not encourage her to divorce. He pretty much said there's nothing more powerful to win a man's heart than a Christian woman who lives out the principles of Christ. Now, he's going to enumerate well, how that works here. This is not advice to two Seventh-day Adventists who get married. Are you listening to me? Now, the principles can be applied, and I'm going to do that. But I just want you to know, this is not written to two Seventh-day Adventists who get married and the husband kind of goes off on his spirituality and the wife's just supposed to 
never have any conflict with him about what's going wrong. Verse 2, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Now, if there's one thing you need to know, uh, some people don't like it, some people are fighting against it, but men and women are very different from every level. And if there's one thing a man is wounded by, that's one way of saying it, if there's one thing a man doesn't like, is that it's very hard for a man to be disrespected. Now, it's true for all people, but it's more true. Women, on the other hand, tend to want to be accepted and loved. Men can live without being loved, at least by some. But a man who's not respected, that's a grave wound on the psychology of a male. Now, I'm speaking in general terms, but it's mainly true. So if you get married and the woman is regularly disrespectful to the man, what kind of marriage are you going to have? Now, I'm going to show you how to get this right. Because if you get it wrong, you can have a, as uh, Emerson Egricks will say in his book, Love and Respect, which some people like and some people don't, but I think there's a lot of good in it. You can have a perpetual downward spiral, which ends in a crash. Verse 3, your adornment must not be external. The braiding of the hair, the wearing of gold and jewelry, and the putting on of dresses. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So I want to remind you again, respect is the center of attraction. And even though you may get gray hair and wrinkles, if you have a beautiful person inside of that feminine person, your beauty can grow through the years and you can be more and more loved. But the world's promoting a feminism that is bossy and disrespectful and exactly the opposite of showing respect and honor. The world's trying to turn everything upside down. They're trying to destroy manhood, womanhood, marriage, gender. It's an all-out war on what God set up for happiness. But there is something in a marriage relationship where when the woman can be truly loved and honored and the man can be truly a protective agent and the woman's not fighting to be the head, but they're working together, it's very beautiful. Verse 5, for in this way in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Now, take your Bibles and turn over to Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul is... Paul is very big on the word submission, and it's not just for women. It's mutual submission. It's acknowledging structure in the church. But what I find is, is that in conservative circles, that men will often abuse the concept of submission and ruin their lives and the lives of their spouses. Verse 18 of Colossians 3 says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about what's fitting in the Lord. I wish I didn't have to deal with this, but I deal with it regularly. I preached a sermon about a month or two ago dealing with this subject matter. And it ended up, I ended up having two different phone calls from people that they're not members of my church. They're members of our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. One came from a lady. And by the way, if you come from a um, honor culture, now America is not an honor culture. It's got a lot of good things. <laughs> and it could learn a lot from the honor cultures. But if you come from an honor culture, the problem I'm talking about right here is way, way worse. And this was a professional woman, probably a little bit older than me. She could hardly talk without crying. She had watched a recent sermon that I had preached. And the problem was, was that in her culture, which was kind of an oriental culture, 
Her husband was an elder in the church, but he was terrible at home, abusive, verbally, I don't think physically. I mean, this lady was a professional. She was, she was a lady with no ordinary uh, pedigree and history, but she could hardly talk without crying because her, her daughter, who also was a professional woman, is a professional woman, was married to someone from the same culture, and it was the same form of whitewashed sepulchrism. Do you know what I mean by that? I'm talking about hypocrisy. I'm talking about men who get up on the platform on Sabbath, and they have beautiful prayers and wonderful altar calls, and they can read the scripture wonderfully, but at home, the experience of their wives is a living hell. The problem that had broken this lady's heart was that not only was her husband this way, but her son-in-law was this way too. And the daughter of this lady wanted to, uh, she wanted to raise her children a certain way, but she had a lot of earning power with her career. She could make a lot of money, but she wanted to stay home, raise her kids. Now the husband had a lot of earning power too, but all the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he earned a year wasn't enough. And this poor grandma's heart was breaking over the fact that she was watching a family system that made a mockery of the principles of true Christianity in the home. And her life, she was getting to the end where she had bad health and no hope of it ever changing. And then as she looked down into the life of her daughter and son-in-law, she had no hope of it changing there either. Now, when you think about your life, all of you need to think about your family system. What kind of family system did you come out of? How did your dad treat your mom? How did your mom treat your dad? The problem is, in some cultures, especially honor cultures, this potential for miscalibration on the respect factor for a woman is so severe that if it doesn't get worked out in the dating and the courtship, there's almost no hope the marriage can ever be good. Now, my head elder at Village Church is a retired surgeon. In the pecking order of physicians, especially in the hospital, he's kind of the top dog. And of course, you hear these horror stories about surgeons throwing instruments when they don't get what they want. And Now, I don't know if he was that kind of surgeon or not. I know him now. I've known him for the last decade, and he's a very fine Christian man. But I can tell you he was married, is married, to a very fine Christian woman. And this lady knows how to show him honor. I think she's a nurse. She worked in his office. And of course, if you're the surgeon, and whether you're in the operating room or you're in the office or whatever it is, there sometimes aren't anybody to check you, to tell you you're behaving poorly. And by the way, what I talked about this morning about being able to stand on your own, you need to know something. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. I've received a paycheck from this denomination since 1987. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to prostitute myself to keep a job. In other words, if somebody above me or a powerful person in my church determines that they're going to try to manipulate me with money or abuse me through working the system behind the scenes or call up my conference president, you need to know something. I'm not going to surrender my Christian principles in order to get a paycheck. And I won't surrender them and didn't surrender them in order to win a wife or anything else like that. And my wife is the same kind of woman, which means with God first in our lives, we knew how, at least we knew where to go to try to work things out. And one day this surgeon comes home and he's being a little bit out of bounds. And I love to hear older people, especially older mothers in Israel, tell these stories. 
And she looked at him with a twinkle in her eye, and she said, we are not at the office now. And she was nicely saying to him, you won't talk to me like that. Now, is that wrong or is that right? Come on now. I want you to think about this. When you get married, you make a promise to love, to honor, to cherish. For richer, for poorer, for better or worse, in sickness and health, to keep yourself holy unto each other until death do you part. Now, I'm here to tell you married love is not unconditional love. There's a new thought for you. <laughs> I stood up in a place like this 39 years ago almost, and I made some promises that I've never made to anybody else in my entire life. And she made some promises to me that she never made to anybody else in her entire life, and I expect her to keep them. And she expects me to keep mine. I'm six foot two, she's five foot two. I weigh 200 pounds, she weighs 100. She's nowhere my match in regards to physical strength. She's a very bright and intelligent 60-year-old fourth grade teacher that I love with all my heart. And she had to learn how to stand up to me, and I had to learn how to be a little more careful in how I conflicted with her. But when you sign up for marriage, you don't sign up with this wrong idea that I'm supposed to be submissive. We just read in Colossians 3.18, as is fitting in the Lord. And if you watched our dear Lord, you found out that he knew how to respectfully have a disagreement with a lot of different people. And in the end, he did it with enough people to where his whole entire ministry team abandoned him. The church set him up, and the Roman government also abandoned him. Jesus was the ultimate man of principle who in the end, after he died for them and they figured out he was there for their sins, they loved him with all their heart and the Christian love and truth went throughout all the world in three centuries. But when you get married, it's not unconditional love. Now there's an unconditional love we're supposed to have for our spouse, but it's not married love. Jesus himself even laid down some conditions on how a marriage could break up. Paul would add to them. Jesus would tell us inside the community of faith, it's infidelity. But sometimes inside the community of faith, people lose their way with Christ and they abandon the faith. And Paul will talk to us in the book of Romans about the fact that when you're abandoned, that's another element of condition on a marriage. But if you don't know how, in your personal private experience to find the strength in God, young ladies, to keep the men that will come into your life from blurring out of bounds. And by the way, strengths can become weaknesses when they're not checked. God has given me a gift for talking. My father made me look up words in the dictionary. I would say to him, what does this mean? He'd say, go look it up. He stretched my mind reading the spirit of prophecy in the Bible, stretched my mind, and then you add to it the gift of talking, and God's given me the ability to reason on my feet very quickly. I could talk circles in a logical, fighting way around my wife, but it would be a form of marital abuse. I told you about my mother moving out of the bedroom. If a lady doesn't have enough inner strength from God, she can't be who God called her to be to hold her husband in check because I'm here to tell you something. Feminine mystique is the most attractive thing to a husband. It's a woman who can't be totally conquered by you because even if you can out-argue her, of course, some of you men are going to be married to women who can out-argue you. <laughs> but even if, you can't, if, if she can't out-argue you, there's a part of her that she knows is, belongs to God. And she's so totally faithful and loyal to you that she's actually going to stand in your way when you're doing something dumb. She's going to stand up to you and say, you're not at the office anymore. And by the way, at the office, you probably better be talking to your workers a little better. There's nothing quite like 
a spouse, in this case, we're looking at the women first, although we're going to get to the men. There's nothing quite like a spouse who will be nice to you until you just cross the line. And what I find is, if you don't examine your family system and you don't think about this, it's generational. You can break the generational pattern, but if you come from a home where the dad kind of does what he wants, irrespective of the family, moves them all the time, spends money in ways that's not respectful, he holds all the power strings, then you're likely to enter into a relationship exactly the same way, but God doesn't want anything to do with it. He wants women who know how to hold their ground while being respectful, understanding that their first loyalty is to God, not their spouse, and he doesn't want women who are trying to, well, you know, he, he wants women who know how to get the point across. Now, there's a lady in the Bible who did this. You know, David had more than one wife, right? Who's the only one that got a proposal? Who's the only one that got asked, will you marry me? Uh, some of the rest of them were arranged. I mean, the first one to Michael... Uh, that was arranged. But there's one lady who gets a proposal. I'm not sure I've read about a proposal directly. We know that Rebecca got a proposal through Eliezer. But there is one woman in the Bible who I think was amazing at this. Turn back to 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25. If there's a woman you want to be, this is the woman. 1 Samuel chapter 25. bad story. Number one, you need to know that Samuel has just died. Why is that bad? Because David's a fugitive, and he's getting kind of insecure about God's plan, whether or not he'll ever become the king. And now the only person who really knew that he was supposed to be the king is dead. And David's still running around the wilderness, but he's happening to guard somebody's sheep. It's a man by the name of Nabal. And imagine if you had 400, 600 men that were as excellent with a sling and a, and a bow and an arrow and a sword, and they were all shepherds. They had all been trained in as shepherds by David. Imagine if those men watched your sheep all through the year, and you didn't lose one sheep to a, a uh, marauding thief, not to a lion, not to a bear. Now we come up to sheep shearing time, and David thinks to himself, we should participate in a little bit of the celebration. Some of those sheep that didn't get hauled off by bears and lions ought to be part of the celebration. So he sends men down to Nabal. Nabal is drunk, and Nabal says, who's David? There's a lot of slaves that have broken away from their uh, owners these days. And I'm telling you what, that was like the worst thing to say to an insecure warrior whose name was David. The, sh the men go back, they tell David, you know what David says? That's it, I'm fed up. Not one man's going to be left alive. Now, that sounds more like Saul than David, all right? Let's just make sure we get this right. But David's going to go down and kill everybody because he didn't get invited to the sheep shearing party. And one of the servants runs to Nabal's wife, Nabal means fool, and says to Abigail, you need to understand there's trouble on the horizon. She says, load up the donkey with bread and figs and, and, and wine. Go ahead of me. I want you to pick up the story with me as that group with that food is on the way. Verse 20 of 1 Samuel 25, now it came as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain, that behold, David and his men were coming down towards her. I mean, he meant business. So she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I've guarded all this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missing, and all that belonged to him of all that belonged to him, and he has returned to me evil for good. May God do the enemies of David, and more so if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. Now look what Abigail does. Abigail saw David. When she saw, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey. Now, listen, I'm getting ready to show you a story where the man is so out of control mad that he's going to make some of the dumbest decisions of his life. And the woman has got to make up for it. Let me show you how she does it. She fell at his feet and said, 
Now, she didn't walk up to him, point his finger in his chest and say, who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing coming to my home to kill my, my sons and my husband and everybody else? No, she doesn't do that. She gets down on, and kneels down in front of him and says, on me alone. Now, I want you to count how many times she calls him my Lord. Remember, this is the insecure fugitive running around the wilderness, doubting whether or not he'll ever be a king. He's low on the security score right now. And I want you to see what she does. She, she knows the word her husband said to her. She knows her husband insulted him. She knows he's wounded. His ego's wounded, whatever, his person. So count how many times she calls him Lord. On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. So she's saying, I know you've got power. I know you're in charge. I'm taking the blame. Please listen to me. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. Obviously wasn't too good of a marriage, was it? But it couldn't have been. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, don't count that one because that's not my Lord, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand. Wow, that's a slap in the face. Man, she's going to beat him up. You watch. She's beating him up with his words. Now then, let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be his neighbor. Now let this gift, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, be given to the young men accompanying my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. There's another slap. She is beating him up. You're not out there taking your anger out on innocent people. My Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, of which this is not one. It's not said there, but it's clearly intended. And evil will not be found in you all your days. Should anyone rise up and pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound up in the bundle of the enemies of the, lo of the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out from the hollow of a sling. And when... The Lord does for my Lord according to all the good he has spoken concerning you and appoints you as ruler over Israel. This will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord. She's beating him up again. And having shed blood without cause by my Lord, having avenged himself when the Lord deals with you, my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Wow. How many did you count? Uh, I think there's 14. 14 times. She tells him while she's bowed down. She reaches up and she hits him. You're not going to shed innocent blood, are you? You're not going to have this bad memory. She hits him. You're going to be king someday. You don't want this on your record. Do you see how this lady did this? She did not violate one dynamic of respect for this man, but she pummels him. And when, he's all, when she's all done, this is what David said. Then David said to Abigail... Because he was a man of truth. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to me. And blessed be your discernment. And blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who's restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, Surely there would not have been left to Nabal until morning as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought, and he said to her, Go to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. You want to know how to be listened to, ladies? Works for men, too. Works with your bosses, works with everybody, but I'm talking about in a male-female relationship, a marriage. If a woman can say to her husband, I love you and I respect you, but this doesn't go. He may fume, depending on his background. He may have come from an abusive home. He may come from an emotionally, spiritually abusive home, physically. Even if that individual, and by the way, I need you to know how abuse works in a home, especially verbal and physical abuse. 
Abuse works on a cycle. What will happen is the abuser will get worse and worse until he realizes that the abused one may break out of the relationship. Then he'll stop. He'll be very sorry. He'll make a bunch of apologies. Then it'll start all over again, and it'll build up until it stops. But it never really stops. They're just excellent manipulators who won't take responsibility for their own problems, usually an anger issue. Usually there's something in the family system that nobody's been willing to talk about. Couldn't say that. That'd be disloyal to the family. Well, I want you to know the Ron Kelly rule of life is if you can be nice about it, you can talk about anything. And everybody's business is not your business, and your business is not everybody's business. There is a sacred circle, but the sacred circle sometimes has to be expanded because sometimes inside the sacred circle there's a lot of abuse going on. In this situation, David was about to do something really dumb. Now take your Bibles and turn over to the Psalms, and I want to show you the psalm that was written as a result of this encounter. Psalm 143, I think it is. Let's find it. Psalm 141. Psalm 141. Ellen White says this psalm was written as a result of this encounter. And I want you to see especially... It's written by David... Verse 1, O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me, give your ear to my voice when I call you. May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands at the evening offering. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth and keep watch over the doors of my lips. Do you think David regretted saying by morning all of Nabal's male children and Nabal are going to be dead? Yeah, he did. Do not incline my heart to anything evil to practice deeds of wickedness with men who do iniquity and do, let me, do not let me eat of their, de- their delicacies. But verse 5 is the verse that's in there for Abigail. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It will be oil upon my head. Do not let me refuse it. Now, in most marriages, in good marriages, husbands and wives figure this out. The husband is careful to not run over the wife, and the wife has to get a little strength to stand up to the husband. And most of the times, you don't have to deal with that. I mean, you will have to deal with it. It's, not a, it's, it's a little bit recurring. But later on, we get to the only invitation that I'm aware of in the Bible, David sends an invite to Abigail. He sends some men to ask her if she'll marry him. I'm not finding it right now, and I'm not going to waste my time there. Let's go back to 1 Peter. She's one of the few people in the Bible who actually gets a proposal. Some of those marriages, lots of them were arranged by the parents. But she gets a proposal. Now let's go to the men. Uh, Actually, verse 6, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you've become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. If you let fear run your lives, ladies, you'll end up with substandard marriages. You have to do what's right, like Sarah, and face your fears. And if you can do that, you'll have the respect of the Abrahams in your life. Now let's go to verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is woman. Now this doesn't mean she's weaker mentally or relationally, but it is a reference to lack in the same kind of physical strength. But I want you to notice what it says. It says, show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, I want you to think about this. In the Bible, 
you are going to be told, women, Ephesians 5, that you're to respect your husband. But in this verse, the real honor is for the woman. And if you don't show your wife this kind of honor, God doesn't want to talk to you. Is that too strong? I think what the verse said is, be sure to show her honor so that your prayers won't be hindered. Now, I have three boys and a girl. And I want to tell you, I love my three boys, but I have a daughter named Julie. She's 23 years old now. And all through the years, she's grown up with three boys, her three big brothers. And when she got a little bit older, people would start saying things like, wow, when it's time for her to be in a relationship, a dating relationship with somebody, and, and I use the word dating and courting interchangeably. I don't want to get stuck. I, I don't think you should date somebody for very long that you wouldn't marry if you figure something out. And it's not a game, but it is the trial periods of your life. And they would say, wow, she's got three big brothers. She doesn't have anything to worry about because whoever dates her. And what I would say to them was, in effect, the three big brothers are nothing. Wait till you meet the dad. <laughs> She's not married. And I have a grave concern that our society's not producing very good men. And if you're listening to me tonight and you're a young man, I need you to know something. The Bible says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. It says that, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians 13. That's what it says. But there's not very many men who are doing this today. They love their toys. They love their jobs. They love their portfolios. They love their opportunities. You know what I'd like for my daughter? I'd like a man who actually is regulated by the Spirit of God, who will be faithful to her by being kind and thoughtful, holding down a good job, being a good dad, caring about Jesus, caring about the church, who can be honest with himself, he can say he's sorry. Real men say they're sorry. But I'm really concerned that there's a lot of people becoming addicted to their phones, to their games, and to sexuality. And it's leaving them kind of shriveled and dried up as a person. This morning I talked with you about being able to be alone. You know, there's going to be times in your dating and courting and in your marriage when things are rough. Why do you think you stand up in front of a couple hundred people and make promises? <laughs> Those people are supposed to say to you, you made a promise, keep it. Those people are supposed to say to you, grow up. You have to be able to suffer through holding people accountable if you want a good relationship. You have to, in effect, say, if I have to live without you, I will, even though it would break my heart. But I'm not going to stay in this relationship while you're gambling all our money away, while you're giving your heart away to someone else, while you're working all the time and there's no time left for our kids. Are you hearing me, ladies? You have to be able to say you're blurring the boundaries on the promises you made and it's not okay with me and it's not good for you or for us. Now, my kids are all emancipated. My daughter still lives at home. I used to tell people, I love my kids. I like them most of the time. And that's how it works. But after my kids are gone, I still have the woman 
And she still has the man that she made a promise to. And I can tell you, while I don't have any grandchildren yet, that'll be a great day when it comes. But kids were the biggest learning module of my life. And harder than being married. <laughs> I have a real Christian wife. So we, we usually worked all our problems out eventually. Some of them were really hard. But commitments matter. And when you make a promise, you keep it. Now, I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth up here. I'm not suggesting to you that you throw down the concept of moving out of the bedroom or moving out of the house or whatever casually. What I'm actually telling you is if you figure out how to be who you are in Christ, you'll know how to have the kind of calibration of trust and respect that you need and affection will flow out of it. But I am saying to you, I watch a lot of abuse of supposed religious doctrine in the name of Christ, so-called, that ruins lives, ruins marriages. And the best marriages I've seen are the ones where the husband shows a lot of honor to the wife. Nobody's more important. You know what? I have, I have five or six pastors on my staff. But you know who the best counselor I have is? Her name is Colleen Ruth Kelly. She knows me. She knows my congregation. She knows God. And I tell my staff, you listen to your wives. She is my other half. And I've had a lot that I've learned with her on the way. We've disagreed about child rearing. We've disagreed about a lot of things, but we've solved those problems. And when she tells me I did something good, I know I did. And when the day comes my wife doesn't want to listen to me preach, none of you should want to listen to me preach either. It's not a game. It's not faking. It's not a show. It's either real or it's unreal. And tonight I want you to know something, ladies. You better know how to rightly stand up. Rightly. Not like the world, not ready to hit somebody with your words, not ready to poke somebody in the chest, but you ought to know how to, in a way, respectfully acknowledge the value of especially those men in your life, brothers and fathers and someday husbands, and at the same time like Abigail say, but you are making a huge mistake. I love you, but you are making a huge mistake. And I'm not going to stand by and watch you do it. And then young men, going to be husbands someday, you need to give extra honor to the woman because she's not set up to be as emotionally independent as you are. God made the women in our lives to create connections. God gave us the men in our lives to make sure those connections don't go wrong and that we do the right thing. I've lived for 40 years with the same woman. I've been faithful to her. And I'm here to tell you, of thousands of decisions we've made, there's two or three times when I've had to say to her, we're not going to do it that way. And they all had to do with raising my adult sons, who by the time they were in their late teens and early 20s, had to look me in the eye and hear me say some things to them they didn't like. But they needed to hear it. I can tell you now, it's been a good journey. I only anticipate it getting better. And my hope for all of you is, you'll know your first loyalty is to God, your next loyalty is to your spouse, and after that, you talk it out. Do what's right, the way God wants it done, and you'll have the best life possible. Let's pray. Lord, the Bible is the ultimate teaching book. We didn't talk about it tonight, Lord, but we see Isaac and Rebekah who had a marriage made in heaven. It was an answered prayer of Eliezer's that brought Rebekah back to Isaac. But by the end of their lives, they're hiding things from each other and living deceptions. Something went very wrong, Lord. And there are countless thousands and millions of other people who have read these stories, allowed your spirit to live in their hearts. And they've chosen a different way, and they've had the blessed joy of happy marital togetherness. But it starts long before they're married. 
We have a number of seniors in this group tonight, Lord, and juniors and sophomores, and then some family members. The principles we build on determine whether or not marriage will be the beginning of love. Or, as Ellen White says, its end. How sad. Thank you, Lord, for showing us how marriage can be the beginning of love. And I thank you. And I pray for everyone listening to me tonight. They'll know how to apply what we looked at from the Bible and that they can have the best and most beautiful, fruitful relationships. Thank you for hearing us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.